Okay, so I would like to start this talk with the waiver. So this is a project whose motivation comes from population uh, genetics, and uh, in the, on the other hand, many techniques come from uh, stochastic analysis. And I would uh, like to try to explain you why this is in interesting for a population geneticist and how it fits into the general, general framework of coordination that Noemi started uh, talking about in her talk. And please for, forgive me if I'm not aware of all technical details. I'm not really expert on SPDs, but luckily Tommaso is one. So this way we could uh, actually do this project. And uh, let's start with just a small reminder what Noemi talked about. So we had uh, our paper with Adrian and Noemi, and there we had particle systems with coordination, right? So we had uh, four kinds of events, reproduction, death, migration, and coalescence on a finite graph. And our main results were moment duality and the invariance of expectation, which only works if there's no coalescence. And this general framework, as we have seen, unifies many former models uh, and yields also interesting new examples. And then Jochen Blatt asked me sometime at the end of 2020 at an online seminar, can one actually extend these uh, techniques and results to continuous uh, space? And of course, that's a very good question, but uh, of course also a bit scary because while some continuous uh, time, continuous space particle systems are uh, straightforward to define, as we will also see in my talk, uh, if you look at the moment dual, this is uh, characterized by a jump SPD. And then the question is, you have a jump SPD, what notion of solution do you have? Uh, do you have existence of solutions? Uh, if yes, you can hope that uh, by duality, you can have also uniqueness and what properties uh, the, the solutions have. And it seemed reasonable to start with small dimensions and with some process that is well known in the case uh, without uh, coordination. So with some well studied processes and one natural candidate uh, which we are looking at is the branching Brownian motion and it's uh, dual, which is the FKPP equation, which corresponds somehow to coordinated reproduction or coordinated selection in the dual picture. So maybe before going into the details of the model, let's talk a bit about coordinated reproduction and uh, selection. So if you look at the moment dual of a process uh, that has coordinated reproduction, uh, as Noemi also told us, this uh, somehow means that in the dual we have these big but rare uh, selective events. And uh, this is a rare selection, contrasting B selection, which corresponds to some kind of continuous term. And uh, there have been several models uh, in the last uh, three years, actually all of them in 2019, in population genetics that uh, Concern, uh, concerned with these kinds of, uh, yeah, basically rare selection comes from some kind of evolutionary events. So Maite likes explaining this model with the lizards and the hurricanes. Uh, and there are also other models in biology that you see these uh, very big, but very rare selective events. And one example is Fernando Cordero and uh, Grégoire Deschamps, uh, who studied actually the same selection term as in, in Noemi's talk. And then there are some other models by uh, Vance Caballero and Milliard or the Adrian, Dario and Maite who had a more general uh, reproduction mechanism. You can also have more than one offspring per individual and then you have a bit different uh, dual process. And uh, in the rather different context of the contact process, this was also mentioned by Noemi, there's the binary contact path process which was introduced by Griffith in 1983. And this is completely different. So this is not population genetics, this is interacting particle systems, systems, but there you can also see this coordinated reproduction and it's actually cross reproduction. So you put your offspring to a different vertex of the graph. So we can see that uh, it appears in many uh, different uh, kinds of models. And now I want to talk about branching Brownian motion first without coordination and then we will introduce uh, coordination. Okay, so what is branching Brownian motion? It's a very classical object. It's a continuous uh, space particle system given as follows. So you start with just one particle at time zero at uh, position zero. Let's see, let's say now we are in one dimension and then every particle move, um, moves independently as a Brownian motion. And at rate r greater than zero, each particle independently gives birth to another particle which has uh, identical dynamics. So for example, here you start with one particle, then it branches, then they continue as two independent Brownian motions, then at some point this particle branches, but the other one doesn't. And then you always have these independent reproduction events and, and more and more particles uh, over time and more and more frequent uh, jump events, but independent uh, reproduction. And then, uh, so the one dimensional branching Brownian motion, if we uh, introduce it uh, formally, it's the following process. So 
the one that we saw in the previous picture, and it's a strong Markov process with state space as the disjoint union over uh, of, of the RNs over N in N. And the notation of the Brownian motion, branching Brownian motion will be just CT, which is a collection of N particles at time T, X1 to Xn. And the number of particles, uh, CT, cardinality is just a pure process. So it's a pure birth process where every particle uh, gives birth at rate R. And we know also that the expected number of particles at time T greater than or equal to uh, zero is uh, C0, so the number of particles at time zero times into the R times uh, T. And uh, the branching Brownian motion was introduced uh, by different people. One important uh, first paper is uh, by McKean in 1975. And then there are these, there's this series of papers by Ikeda, Nagasawa, and Watanabe uh, in 1968-69. And yeah, so this is what branching Brownian motion is. And then let's see what is coordinated branching Brownian motion. So now we can uh, imagine how this works, given Noemi's talk, right? So we have this reproduction, and then we have we want to introduce coordinated reproduction. And for this, we choose a measure R, which is a finite measure on 0, 1. And then we write uh, this uh, fracture R for the atom size of the atom of the measure at 0, and this uh, Roman R for the total mass of the measure. And then this R coordinated branching Brownian motion, RCBBM, is again denoted by CT. And it's a p valued strong Markov process where we have these binomial uh, birth events, these binomial reproduction events. So particles still move as independent Brownian motions in R. And then reproduction is basically independent of the spatial positions and these coordinated things. So at, assume that at time t greater than or equal to zero, we have CT consisting of n particles, x1 and so on, xn in R. And uh, yes, then we have basically for all non-empty subsets, I of n, the possible transition that you add a copy of these particles xi i in i, and uh, such transitions you have at rate integral over 0, 1, y to the cardinal rate of i, uh, i minus 1 minus y to the n minus the cardinal rate of i times this 1 over y, r of dy. So it's the same as, as before in Noemi's talk. The difference is now that you can't write just and choose cardinality of i because you also have to take into account the spatial position. So therefore, for every subset, you have a separate rate. But it's still uh, this binomial uh, nature of uh, branching events. And you still have the standard abuse of notations that if you integrate over 0, then you get the atom at 0 of the measure r. And uh, this is for i having just one element and uh, 0 rate if i is having at least two elements. So this means that. Uh, at zero, we still have this coordinate, this sorry, independent uh, reproduction. So just one particle independently reproducing. This means that the usual branching Brownian motion is a mu CVBM where mu is just uh, r times delta zero. Okay, so that's a coordinated branching Brownian motion. It was not difficult to define. And here we can see a picture. So you start with one particle moves in the Brownian motion, then it, it branches at some point. And then at time t2, it happens that both of the particles branch. No, for only this guy branches, the other one doesn't. And for example, at time t3, we had before three particles and then two of them branch. And after that, we have uh, five. So not everybody, sorry, everybody, but uh, sometimes more than one particle uh, gives birth to a new particle. OK, so what do we know from uh, Noemi's talk, actually? So. This, if you just look at the number of particles of the coordinated branching Brownian motion, then this is actually a coordinated branching coalescing process in the sense of Noemi's talk. So this means that uh, we have a graph with just vertex set V, so one set. Edges don't matter. Reproduction measure is this R, V, V equal to R. And all the other measures, uh, death, coalescence, or migration, they are, they are zero. And then according to Noemi's talk, we see that there's no coalescence. So we have the invariance of expectation, which means that all the branching Brownian motions with coordination have the same expectation as the branching Brownian motion without coordination with the same total uh, rate r of the measure r. So the expected number of particles is just e to the total mass of the measure r times t. And then the moment you have, you also know what it looks like. So it's a 0, 1 valued stochastic process solving a jump SDE. So we have these selection terms, right? So this. Uh, x times x minus 1 type selection terms. And there's this continuous term uh, for the atom at 0, so r times x dx t minus 1. 
And then we have this Poissonian term where you integrate over y in 0, 1, y times x t minus x t minus minus 1, so still this kind of nonlinearity, times r of dt dy, where r of dt dy is a Poisson point process on 0 infinity times 0, 1, we can basically measure dt times 1 over y r of dy. So this means in particular, if uh, you have a singularity here, so if this measure is not finite, then uh, in this dual process, you can have an infinite frequency of jumps, very, very small jumps, very uh, densely. Uh, but it doesn't explode in finite time, so it's still, I mean, still a zero-one valued process. And then if you look at the moment dual of the coordinated branching Brownian motion, then we want to show that it's basically the same uh, as the, informally speaking, just you add the Laplace operator to this, and then uh, you have a jump SPD. So this is that we want to want to see that actually happens. Uh, so in the non-coordinated case, let's see first what happens uh, with the branching Brownian motion. So if you have non-coordinated branching Brownian motion, then the moment dual is actually this FKPP, fischer kolmogorov petrovsky Diskunov uh, equation. And what I write here is one minus the moment dual. So it's for historical reasons. Uh, these authors who introduced this equation in 1937, uh, they looked at positive selection instead of negative selection. And therefore, uh, you have, instead of uh, this negative selection term, you have a positive selection term here. So this is a plus here. So dt of u, u is uh, one half Laplace of u plus r times u times one minus u with some initial condition u zero. And you see that this is basically the heat equation plus this nonlinearity of this periodic uh, selection uh, form. And uh, this is a very well studied uh, equation. So introduced in two papers, one by Fischer and the other by Kolmogorov, Petrovsky and Tiskunov. And uh, one of the famous properties of this equation is that it has a traveling wave uh, solution. So it has wave speed uh, square root of two times r, and uh, it has the form w of x minus square root of two r t for some explicit function uh, w, which means that if you look at a nice initial condition, which doesn't have to be that nice. So you can, for example, start with the heavy side initial uh, condition where you have zero on one half axis and then one on the other half axis, then uh, limit as uh, t tends to infinity ut of x plus lambda t is zero for lambda greater than this speed, square root of r, and limit of ut x of lambda, x plus lambda t is uh, equal to one for lambda uh, less than square root of two r. So you have this critical speed uh, square root of two r with, at which your solution moves. And since u is deterministic, so there's no randomness here in this equation, the duality just means that u of t x is one minus the probability that the maximal displacement, so the position of the rightmost particle of the branching Brownian motion is less than or equal to x. So the square root of 2r is also the speed of the rightmost particle of the branching Brownian motion. And there are many much finer results on this speed and also on the shape of w. So uh, one also knows the second order term and, and many other things. And uh, some important papers are just a few of them is, is Bremson and then Lely, Selke, and Cortinas, Hartung, uh, Luidor, for example, there where you can uh, look at uh, the terms of this uh, smaller order terms of uh, this expansion of the speed. Okay, so that's it. And then what happens in the coordinated case? We want to see that we have the same uh, equation as for the number of particles, but we also have this uh, Laplace term for the Brownian motion of the of the particles. So this is in principle a jump SPD and everything else is as, as before. And then there are questions, for example, what is the solution of this? And uh, do we have a solution? Do we have duality? Do we have uniqueness? And then uh, does this equation have a well-defined uh, wave speed? So now, since we have this Poisson measure here, the solution is now random. So it's not the same as before. But for having a wave speed, it's not necessary to have actually a traveling wave solution. But maybe it's easier to show that we have some critical lambda 0 such that limit as t tends to infinity ut of x plus lambda t is 0 if you look at a larger speed than lambda 0 and limit of ut x plus lambda t is equal to 1 if, if you look at a smaller speed than uh, lambda 0 in probability. And uh, also we look at this uh, for some, for any Hölder continuous initial condition that is uh, 0, 1 valued outside the compact subset. So basically compact is supported in the sense that outside this compact set it's either 0 or 1. And if yes, then this wave speed can be compared to the wave speed of the original uh, branching Brownian motion without coordination. And then the question is, do we have a higher speed or a lower speed? Or do we have the same as, as in a non-coordinated uh, case? 
Okay, so these are the main questions we want to look at. And first, I will speak now about the wave speed and uh, without saying anything about the existence yet, but I will, I will speak about existence and weakness and duality in the end. So let's uh, talk a bit about the many to one lemma, which is one of the important uh, techniques in general for uh, some kind of branching particle systems where you have uh, motion and branching independence. So it's also true for uh, branching Levy processes or branching random walk in a discrete uh, space or this time step story. So let uh, CT be an R co coordinated branching Brownian motion. You start at uh, one particle at position zero at time zero. And then by ST, we denote the maximal displacement at time, at time ST. So the position of the rightmost uh, particle. And then let BT just be a Brownian motion in one dimension. And then what do we obtain by the many to one lemma? This is always, always true in a quite general uh, context. So what is the probability that the rightmost particle is larger than t times y, the position of the rightmost particle. This means that there exists at least one k between one and the number of particles at time t, such that this xk is greater than t times y. And then this is basically uh, the expectation of a union, of expectation of an indicator of a union. So this by union bound, you can be bound by the expectation of uh, c times t, number of particles, times the probability that one Brownian motion at uh, time t is greater than t times y. So this is actually the many to one lemma step where we use that all the marginal distributions are just of a one dimensional Brownian motion. And then uh, we know that bt has the same distribution as, as t times b1. So we write this here. And then we know, okay, the expected number of particles is e to the r times t as we have seen. And the Brownian motion being greater than the square root of t times y well, it's some smaller order terms times e to the minus y squared t divided by two. So this is the standard Gaussian tail estimate. And this means that uh, this probability will tend to zero whenever y is larger than square root of two r. So this uh, shows us that actually as an upper bound, we already have the correct speed of the uh, branching Brownian motion, right? In the case when there's no coordination, then the square root of two r is actually sharp, at least in the exponential scale. So this, what we did here, is true for any coordinated branching Brownian motion, but uh, if there's no coordination, so if r is r times delta zero, then this upper bound is more or less uh, tight. That is tight in the exponential scale in the limit t tending to infinity, so the speed of the rightmost particle turns out to be square root of 2r. And I will say something about this on the next slide, which is important here. So yes, heuristically, ct is, uh, in the classical case, when there's no coordination, it's very close to its expectation uh, with high probability, at least after taking logarithms. And why is this true? Because ct times e to the minus rt, this is a non-negative martingale, and it's actually uniformly integrable in the non-coordinated case. So it tends in L1 and almost surely to its expectation, which is just one, expectation of C0, right? You start with one particle at time zero, and this is the expectation of the martingale. So this inequality is, is fine on the exponential scale as t tends to infinity, and actually the limit of one over t logarithm of the expectation of ct, this equals the quenched or almost sure growth rate, which is just limit of one over t log ct without expectations. So it actually tends to this expected uh, value. And then the question is, does the same hold in the coordinated case? And uh, if you look at ct times e to the minus r times t, and it's easy to see that it's still a martingale, but now actually it's not uniformly integrable anymore. So this martingale is not anymore that uh, useful. And this martingale is actually uh, converging almost surely to zero, unless r is a multiple of, of delta zero. So unless we only have co uh, non-coordinated independent reproduction. And this way, the quenched growth rate is uh, strictly lower than the unyield uh, average growth rate, which is e to the r times t all the time. And let's see one example, which is uh, somehow the easiest one, where we can see that actually the typical uh, growth rate is, is lower than this e to the r times t. And the simplest case is when uh, everybody branches at the same time. So this uh, also Noem is talking to this example when uh, the measure reproduction measure is just delta one times r. So r times delta one, this means fully coordinated reproduction. So everybody reproduces at the same time. And you remember in the independent case, you had more and more frequent branching events, but every time only one particle branching. Here, it's not the case because we have basically according to uh, times of a Poisson process, we have these reproduction events, but every time everybody branches. So you still have this exponential growth. And uh, this means that if you have a Poisson process MT of intensity R, then you can construct uh, basically the number of particles at time T as two to the two to this MT. 
So here's the first branching, then you have two particles, second branching, uh, four particles, third branching, eight particles, and so on. Everybody always reproducing. So the expected number of particles of CT, we know already it has to be equal to e to the r times t, but we can see that this is also the expectation of two to the nt, right? And this means that somehow this expectation is related to the exponential moments of nt. So what is a typical behavior for n, uh, Typical behavior for this CD is somehow governed by the large deviation behavior of this Poisson uh, process. But we know what N NT does, right? So NT divided by T, this is the Poisson law of large numbers, it tends to R, which is just the rate of the Poisson process. So uh, this is almost like the law of large numbers, but a continuous time uh, version of this. So if I look at one over T log of CT, this is a uh, logarithm of uh, 2 to the nt divided by t. So it's nt log 2, log 2 divided by t. And it stands to r times log 2 almost surely. So there's this factor of log 2. It's indeed smaller than uh, 1. So ct, number of particles of ct behaves like 2 to the r times t with high probability. OK, so this is more or less uh, rigorous here. And then uh, at some point, I'm getting a bit less rigorous because I don't want to uh, tell you the whole proof. But the next step is we look at uh, R being R times delta P. So now in every event, uh, everybody uh, branches with probability P independently of the other particles. And uh, the intensity of jump events is then integral over zero one, one over Y R of dy. So this is R divided by P. And every individual participates uh, in each event with probability P. So this means if you have in such an event, then typically uh, you have an increase by a factor of one plus P by a factor of p, so you had some number of particles, and then you have 1 plus p times this number of particles after the after the branching event. So the crash growth rate should be heuristically logarithm of 1 plus p to the r divided by p. So it is r divided by p times log 1 plus p. And if you consider finite linear combinations of such data p's, then you obtain that in general, you should have something like integral uh, over 0, 1, log 1 plus y divided by y, r of dy as quench growth rate, where we again have the abuse of notation. Sorry, uh, forget this log, so it's just y. It's log 1 plus y divided by y, r of dy integrated over 0 is just the atom at 0. So log 1 plus 0 divided by 0 is basically 1. And then uh, one can actually make this uh, heuristics rigorous by a channeling argument using some large deviation estimates, like saying that uh, it, at every reproduction event, basically uh, something not very untypical happens uh, regarding these heuristics here, as long as the measure is supported in delta one for some delta greater than zero. If the support of R includes zero, which can mean two things, either you have an atom at zero or you have a so-called jump singularity. So maybe you don't have an atom at zero, but uh, for any uh, delta, you have a positive mass on zero delta, and then you have in the dual these uh, infinitely frequent jumps then we need some additional arguments. So then it doesn't work because this main point in this channeling argument is, as I will talk about it, that you assume basically that uh, all branching events happen at fixed times. And this you can only do if you have uh, basically a finite rate of, of branching events. Okay, so we want to see first an upper bound. So the link soup of one over T log, here's a, sorry, cardinality missing, so log of CT uh, is that or equal to this integral over zero one log one plus y divided by y r of dy, which we call c. So we want to see this quote almost surely. And so far we know this uh, in the case when the support of r is between delta and one for some positive delta. And yeah, vaguely speaking, this means that uh, if we can show that we have additivity with respect to the measure in this formula, then, then we are already in a good position. So this we actually do, but I, I don't want to talk about the proof of that here. But there are two kinds of jumps. So they are the big jumps where participation probability is, is between delta and one, and there are the small, small jumps where the participation probability is just between zero and delta. In the extreme case, when it's zero, it means there's just one particle uh, participates uh, there. So this means the small jumps, the number of particles grows due, grows, uh, due to them by at most the corresponding annual growth rate, which is just e to the total mass of the measure between zero and delta times t. And this follows basically by Martingale convergence and Fatus lemma and, and this additivity between uh, the part of the measure between zero and delta and the part between delta and one. And then the jumps associated with uh, delta and one, these give, these give actually the correct formula for the growth rate 
when you have an integral only between delta and one, not between zero and one, because now we ignore the small jumps. So an upper bound on the trenched growth rate is for any delta, basically total mass of the measure between zero and delta, which is too much, but it's not a big problem because you add this that integral over delta one log one plus phi divided by y r of dy, and as delta tends to zero, this actually tends to this formula here. So then there's no problem in the in the limit. So in the end, the martingale actually becomes useful, but just uh, for very small uh, delta. So one more sentence about this is that I have only provided you heuristics, of course, uh, only for delta one, a rigorous calculation for this, but how to make these uh, actually rigorous and what do they tell about the coordinated FKTT equation? So what we will see in the end is that this is actually the wave speed of uh, coordinated uh, equation. So, so if you have this, uh, Quenched growth rate C, then square root of two times C is the correct uh, wave speed of the FKPP equation with coordination. And scratch of proof of the upper bound is the following. So the rate at which the reproduction event happens, you see that this depends on N, right? But uh, if delta is positive and you only look at the jumps that have uh, participation probability between delta and one, then this density dependence somehow becomes negligible as n tends to infinity. And, and for very large uh, population sizes, we can basically assume that jump times uh, happen at deterministic times and their sizes are also deterministic. So they are basically not, not deterministic, but they are just the atoms of this underlying Poisson point process that has intensity dt times one over y r of dy restricted to y between delta and one. So it's still random who participates, but which y and uh, which times these are, this is given by the Poisson process uh, now. And then we can define a condition variant of the coordinated branch in Brownian motion, where these big jumps that have probability greater than delta, this happen precisely at the times of the Poisson point process, while the other uh, times and sizes of the jumps, uh, which are associated with the measure between zero and delta, these are still random uh, as before. And then particles still decide to participate independently. And if, if, if this is delta equals one, then this uh, delta one is an empty set. And then we have just the original coordinated uh, branch in Brownian motion. Okay, and, and this separation between big jumps and small jumps, this uh, gives us this coordinated CDBM, which is a new process. And this is actually the moment dual of the coordinated FKPP equation, as we will see, conditional on the atoms of the Poisson point process that have uh, y, j greater than delta. So this is a condition, condition version of the uh, CBBM, the same FKPP equation, but it's a conditioned uh, duality. And then we apply a quenched version of the many to one lemma, so not precisely the same as I showed you, but a quenched version of this, where you also condition on the big, big jumps. And then the limb soup, uh, in this limb soup, has to be less than or equal to what it has to be. So this uh, square root of two times uh, C. Okay, so this is basically in a nutshell, the upper bound and in an even smaller nutshell, the lower bound is uh, based on the idea by other people from 2004 and five. So there's one paper by Englander and Cipriano and one by Cipriano alone. So we again use this condition duality and we look at the principal eigenvalues and this kind of local survival analysis uh, of the process with, with uh, adding drift to the Brownian motions, and uh, we do it analogous to the Englander, Kipriano, and Kipriano. And in the lower bound, the nice thing is that uh, we can compare the process to a smaller process, which is obtained by ignoring uh, all jumps of size strictly between zero and delta. We don't ignore the atom at zero, but the atom at zero for the FKPP equation just gives a continuous term. So this doesn't uh, cause us uh, troubles here. And then we also obtain the lower bound. Of course, it's several pages of computation, but uh, I don't want to give into go into more details uh, here now. So then we have the correct uh, wave speed. And then now I want to continue with some kind of essentials. So actually we have existence of solutions, duality and, and so on. So the first theorem guarantees existence. So fix any measure R uh, on M, which is a finite Borel measure on zero one. And let omega fp be a probability space supporting a Poisson point process S on zero infinity times zero one with the correct intensity measure dt times one over y r of dy. And let ft be the right continuous filtration generated by uh, st. So st is s restricted to zero t times uh, zero one. 
And then here we start with well, there are continuous initial conditions. Somehow that fits uh, well into this uh, framework. So u0 is alpha earlier continuous for some alpha between 0 and 1. Uh, and then for any such initial condition, there exists unique up to modification on an asset that it process u, which goes from omega to the score code uh, space of Cadillac path here from 0 infinity to c alpha 0 1 uh, r, which solves our uh, coordinated FKPP equation. Uh, where derivatives like this dt and this Laplace, uh, they are interpreted in the sense of distributions. And the integral against r is just interpreted in the sense of sums over Poisson point processes, right? So you look at this Poisson point process as a sum of Dirac deltas. It's an infinite sum, so it could happen that not every sum is uh, well defined, but apparently this one with this y times u, 1 minus u, uh, this is actually summable almost surely, so it also makes sense. With u of 0 something is u0 of something. Right, so we have existence, and then we also uh, have. Uh, so, what? How does one show this? Basically, we have to restrict first our Poisson point process again to zero infinity times delta one. So we again somehow exclude uh, small jumps, and as delta tends to zero, we actually verify tightness and guarantee that all weak subsequential limits also satisfy the suitable Martingale problem associated with the generator of the of the branching Brownian motion, basically. And then the so then the so-called Martingale solution, which I didn't write here because it's also quite technical and even a longer definition, also exists. And using this Martingale solution that uh, satisfies this limiting Martingale problem, we will also uh, get the duality. And uh, duality also gives us uniqueness in law. Okay, so in, for the duality, we actually want to verify the following assertion. So again, fix a measure R on zero one find that measure and let u be a martingale solution, which now we know exists, to this coordinate FKPP equation associated to this measure. For any x in p, so any uh, element of the union of uh, Rns, let ct be an R uh, coordinated branching brown motion started in x, then we have this moment duality. So as I said in the beginning, for historical reasons, we are looking at positive selection and therefore the duality function is not x to the n here, but one minus x to the n. So the expectation of one minus ut to the x is the expectation of one minus u zero to the uh, ct. And uh, yeah, during the proof of the existence of Martingale solutions, Thomas who did all these regularity uh, estimates and at some point he noticed that such solutions are actually smooth for any positive time. So you start with some holder continuous initial condition at time zero and at any positive time it's actually infinitely differentiable. And this is very nice for us because this makes the proof of duality uh, quite simple. It's less than one page and also no approximation is necessary. So, so it's quite a convenient uh, proof. Okay, so a bit more about extensions and variants of this problem and, and challenges. So both the existence of Martingale solutions and the duality have conditional versions, as I already uh, mentioned. So there you somehow distinguish between uh, small jumps and big jumps and you assume that the large jumps happen that have probability larger than delta for participation these happen at uh, atoms at the Poisson point process so at times tj with participation probability yj and then these are heavily used in all the proofs and for delta equals one this means no conditioning but somehow one can ask the question what happens if delta equals zero so what happens if i uh, condition on all atoms of the Poisson point process and this is maybe related to what jan asked from noemi about uh, some kind of strong existence, right? So can you get uh, the process as a function of the Poisson point process? And yes, in this case, uh, we can actually construct the FKPP, the solution of the FKPP equation on the same probability space as the Poisson point process. And this is due, due to the fact that we only have Poissonian noise, right? So we don't have any kind of uh, white noise term here, some kind of coalescence term in the branching Brownian motion. And, and this way, one can really do this pathwise. So we have uh, a solution in the end that's also uh, possible to see from the from the existence uh, proposition so the solution is weak in the pde sense so differentials are just uh, meant in the distributional sense but it's strong in the stochastic sense so if i give you the well, at some point process you can pathwise construct uh, the solution from that and we also expect that this, this implies that we have a strong pathwise duality but we actually didn't write this down so we haven't worked out uh, the details so far that's one thing. The other thing is adding uh, death. So we have also seen Noemi's uh, talk that death is somehow 
uh, very important in coordinated models, especially because few people studied this before. And uh, particles uh, would here die in a coordinated fashion, so again associated to a measure, which is now called D. And then you have these binomial participation probabilities in, in big death events. And uh, we do it similarly to reproduction. And then what does this give us in the dual process? It's basically uh, non, an inhomogeneity, right? So selection term was nonlinear. This is lin linear, but this gives us an inhomogeneity of the form uh, mass of the death measure at 0 times u tx minus integral over 0, 1, y times u t minus an x d of dt dy, where this d is now a different Poisson point process independent of the of the one for the reproduction, and this has intensity dt times d of dy divided by y. So this term in the FKPP equation means a mutation towards the weaker type, and the existence and duality we expect. We didn't write it down, but it should work similarly to the case uh, without death. So this means that you have here, for example, reproduction, one guy reproducing, then you have this coordinated reproduction event, two guys reproducing. Then you have death in a coordinated way, two of the four guys dying. Then you have a reproduction event, both of them reproducing, and then you have a death where just one guy uh, dies, and so on. So what is the difficulty here? First of all, the quench growth rate, if you look at, again, uh, simple measures like uh, delta p for the death measure, then we expect that the quench growth rate will be the same as before, plus an analogous term. Uh, for the death. So integral over 0, 1, 1, log 1 minus y instead of 1 plus y here, divided by y, d of dy. Conditioned on survival, right? So if you have death, it can happen that you start with one particle and maybe the first event is that it dies, then uh, there's almost an extinction forever. But if it survives, then uh, our guess would be square root of 2 times c uh, for this uh, quench growth rate. For this, c has to be greater than 0. So at least if c is less than 0, then we expect that almost surely we have extinction. And what is interesting here is that this term can make the whole sum minus infinity, right? So even if uh, D has no atom at one, but is just very strongly concentrated near one, so everybody has a very high probability to participate in that event, then this is minus infinity here. And then we have somehow, uh, yeah, minus infinite uh, growth rate of the process, despite the fact that maybe there's no coming down from infinity, as I mentioned, right? So coming down from infinity is only if, uh, if you have an atom at one for the death measure. So what is the problem here? The proof of the lower bound is problematic here because uh, in the case when both the reproduction measure and the death measure have a positive mass on zero data for any data then greater than zero, so both have a singularity and not just atoms at zero, but like a jump singularity. And if you remove ma mass from zero delta, as long as we had only reproduction, we said, okay, now the process becomes smaller. But if you have both reproduction and death and you remove something from zero delta, you don't know if it increases or decreases. So this is somehow problematic due to missing monotonicity. And uh, after we put our paper on archive, Bastian Malen uh, contacted us and he suggested some alternative approach in involving uh, his uh, prior work where he used, where he basically looked at similar problems, but for discrete time, branching uh, random walks. And somewhat surprisingly, this discrete time result uh, can be used for the continuous time result. So now we expect that one should obtain the correct quench growth rate also with death, but not in all cases, but we actually need the moment condition on, on D. So some uh, logarithmic moment condition on, on D, and then, then actually this should work out. But this is definitely a question of future work, especially as long as our first paper is still under uh, review. Okay, so death is somehow an open question. We, we expect that this is uh, going to be partially solved by this approach, but, but there are still open questions. For example, what happens if this D doesn't satisfy the moment condition? Okay, further open questions. So one thing is uh, we looked only at alpha Hurler continuous initial conditions, which is uh, somehow suitable for our setting, even with this uh, compact support, so to, so to speak. But can one, for example, look at the heavy side initial condition, which is uh, the usual initial condition one likes to consider at, uh, in the FKPP setting? Next question, question is, can we add coalescence? So there's this uh, paper by Shiga, nine, by, nine, uh, by Shiga in 1988, which is the start of this. So then in the branching ground motion, you add coalescence, but uh, this you do in one dimension where Brownian particles uh, tend to meet. And then according to intersection local time, uh, if, if, you have, if they have spent uh, enough time next to each other, then they coalesce. But this then gives like a right fisher noise type term, but with a uh, white noise, space-type white, white noise. 
and this messes up uh, things and it's one question if one can do this uh, in our case when there's coordination for the reproduction and the death and and the other question is uh, can we add seed banks so there's this recent work by uh, Jochen Blatt, Matthias Hammer and Florian and me and also uh, follow-up papers also including uh, Dave Jacobi uh, where they look at uh, seed banks so this on-off branching brownian motion it sometimes uh, switches off and then it switches back and in the FKPP equation, they have a seed bank. So can we also introduce this in the coordinated uh, way, also with simultaneous switching, like in Noemi's talk, and how to compute the wave speed in this case? So that somehow seems to be more difficult uh, if you have uh, higher dimensions. Even without coalescence, it seems to be a challenge. And then one other question would be multi-dimensional models. So can we have somehow localized reproduction event, like for the spatial lambda framing view process? And uh, some of you also asked, uh, can one do uh, spatial branching processes, like uh, continuous space branching processes with coordination, that's also one possible uh, research direction that's somehow related to this. Yes, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.